I'm not going to be talking too much, but I've got some experts along to help us with um, some of the topics. So tonight we're going to focus on um, brain health and performance for life and sport. So we've got an expert in that area. We're going to a little piece on nutrition and then um, injury prevention and particularly in sailing with some of the tips and tricks to prevent injuries. And as well, I've been lucky enough to have one of our um, NZL sailing team members join us. So Vila is an IQ foil sailor. So we're very happy to have her along to uh, give her perspective on these topics. So, so again, thanks, V, and we'll hear from you through the presentation. So I guess now I'm going to hand over to Kelsey, um, who is going to lead it from our high-performance team, and I hope it's going to be an interesting evening and that um, we'll all learn a little something that will help us support our girls in sailing. So I'll hand over to you, Kelsey. Cool. Thanks, Jenny. Um, before we start, can I just ask everyone to put themselves on mute just so it's seamless? Um, but starting us off today is going to be John. Uh, John is a performance psychologist, or Dr. John. Um, so, John, take it away. I will be definitely weaving in the wonderful talent I have next to me because we start with the brain, but everything interconnects. And so what I will do is talk a bit and they will expound on it throughout. And so this really is a team effort. As you can tell, we've already started with a team effort. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Thank you. Team effort. I kind of want some takeaways, which I'll weave in throughout the discussion. Is really kind of brain health as a process. I'm I'm replacing what we typically talk about mental health with brain health because it's more accurate. You know, it, it really ties into the other pieces that you know both the other talented prevents, uh, presenters are going to really talk about Kelsey and Mark. And, and so I will look at and define what process means and it'll make more sense when we go through it. The other piece we don't often talk about is mental health comes from, in the environments we're in, from not doing enough rest and recovery because all the stimulation we do only comes together with that, that uh, recovery pieces. And certainly I know Mark will talk more about that. Then we're gonna talk about an athlete readiness model. When do you feel ready? When do you don't? And then what do you do about it? And where do you go for resources? So, so those are some of the key takeaways. As I mentioned, you know, the opportunity we kind of ignore is we, we don't talk about the brain, that we're a brain first system, that we're a brain runs 11 systems that you see in front of you. And those 11 systems are, yes, our brain is coupled with our body and a very, for very particular reasons. It's not either or, it's really managing together. Because without brain health, we don't really have health. And, and one of the things is, is to create brain health, we're creating a high performance opportunity. And where that really, really starts is this process. So all of you go through this every day. And you can even think about your life situations with this too. But we think about sport, physical activity. You know, you guys are asked to do things on demand, whether it be fitness, you know, away from the water, whether it be absolutely being on the water and practicing your routines and your teaming. And certainly Mark will talk about how to stay physically healthy so you can continue to kind of do that on a regular basis and talk about load. The other thing is rest and recovery, which Mark and I will be talking about. I'll talk about from a brain first standpoint, but that's the glue that makes everything together. Kelsey is going to be talking about nutrition. And one of the reasons why we eat is to fuel the brain, but also to produce proper hormones and neurotransmitters, how the brain communicates with the body. So these are fundamental processes. And then we look at cognitive training, you know, that piece of strategy, that piece of study you might be doing, whether you do that in sailing or you're doing that as a student. And then one of the most important things we often get wrong is we talk about we think first, then we feel. No, emotions run the show in sport and life. And life is about emotional management. And so we'll, we'll touch on one of the bigger pieces that assist with that. Another thing we don't often talk about from a brain health standpoint, we're wired to connect. 
And we probably remember during COVID through all the waves of lockdown, how much we missed connecting with others, how much it regulates us, how much it makes us feel better, but also it allows us to learn and allows us to process certain things. And the last piece, synergy of the, of the acronym process has to do with each one of your plans, whether it be talk about brain health, whether it talks about nutrition, whether it talk about kind of physical readiness is individualized. It is not one size fits all. And so that's a part of your journey with the experts you have around you, your parents, your teachers to really kind of help you. So remember when we're talking about brain health, we have to look at all these components process. And some of you might want to think about, you probably already have tremendous amount of strengths in some of these areas, but where are your areas of development? But your number one performance enhancer is sleep. And it's one we overlook. We spend one third of our life in it. And the healthy range is seven to 10 hours. But most people in a modern culture sleep under seven. And so that doesn't allow for what is really important in sleep is the brain cleans itself, it detoxifies, it rejuvenates connections and memory, managing emotions, attention, learning, and, and also really kind of fuses together the, the other systems. Because once the brain kind of rejuvenates, makes those connections, then it turns on every other system to clean itself and rejuvenate and get stronger. So sleep is your number one performance enhancer. And if it starves off a lot of mental health issues. So what generally happens, and many of you probably noticed, I know I experienced this, but most human beings do. If you don't have a good night of sleep, you're more anxious. And that's actually for a reason. It's to put us, be vigilant on our toes, to be aware, because it knows we haven't rested enough. And so it's trying to keep us safe. But the other thing is if we go a long period of time without sleep, then we start to feel a little bit down. Our mood is flat. And so those sort of things can happen if we're not getting this foundational piece right. Sleep is the most important. It connects with everything. What we also know is when you have chronic sleep, and that can be as much as just three nights in a row for under six, six hours. And so that can happen in a modern world is we really don't prioritize this part of our, our training program, is one of the things that can happen, team effort again, these are some of the consequences of sleep loss. Just a few days, your reaction time as an athlete goes down. And so your ability to have speed, your ability to have fine motor movement coordination, to just move and decide goes down. But also immune suppression, you know, uh, Kelsey may talk about it, that our immune systems in our gut. Well, again, our gut and our brain are connected. So if we're immunity drops, we're more open to getting ill, not being ready, not being able to connect with the things that matter to us in our training and our life. But if we even go weeks, there's hormone changes. And this can happen very, very easily. And so testosterone is something both men and women have and has to do with a resiliency factor. So if we're dropping in testosterone, this is very, very key to this inability that's going to come up. But if you think about sailing, sailing is a lot about waiting patiently and observing, observing what's happening on the horizon, what's happening with the boat, what's happening with the environment around us. So decision-making can drop off. And so again, as we really make sure our sleep is strong, we're really making sure we're strong performers from a standpoint of health and human performance. But if we go months, our resiliency from a, an emotional level, cognitive level, physical level reduces, and the brain actually shrinks. Now, again, it can come back, but with sincere lack of really focus on a sleep process, we really our, our skills contract, our abilities contract. So this is your number one thing if we're gonna look at mental health. If we don't do this right, it doesn't matter how hard you train, it doesn't matter how good you eat, sleep comes first, then everything else optimizes it. So this is an important reflection on what we do uh, with one third of our life connects to what we wanna do and the things that we're most passionate about. Last thing I wanted to touch on was kind of reducing some of the stigma 
around how we talk about brain health or mental health or emotional health concerns. And this, this continuum you have in front of you could be thought of as a readiness. How ready am I? How ready am I to engage you know, in the things in my life, uh, sailing, education, socially? How, how well am I? And this has been used through actually in the US and Canada and New Zealand uh, within the military, within sport, within education systems. So instead of us thinking about the terms that maybe turn us off about having these conversations, we can think about, am I in the green? Am I in the yellow? Am I orange or red? You know, and also look at, if you look at this chart, it's a way of thinking about what do I do in these spaces? If you're in the healthy space, you want to look at what are the things that make you feel that way? Do you have good supports? especially around that socialization piece, often being away from those who give us those connections and, and, and bolster you know, not only our emotional health, but all the things that go with that, our, our immunity, our neurological resilience. But if we look at even that orange section where you're injured, one of the things it talks about is decreased performance. If you're having multiple multiple experiences of decreased performance, and if you look at that last section there, is tune in, talk to someone, and, and ask for help. We don't have to suffer in silence. Performance is a wonderful indicator about how well we're doing. And if we're having a number of really poor practices, poor training sessions, poor study sessions, then this is a good indicator we might want to connect. We don't have to wait. We want to prevent these things. And so one of the most important things is use this as a way to, to really kind of have a language. We don't have to really use technical language. We go, hey, I'm in the green, I'm in the yellow, I'm in the orange, I'm in the red. And then look at those things and how they match for you and what can I be doing? Because the biggest thing is we want to prevent. So let's use sleep on this continuum. You have three days of poor sleep it's time to connect with someone because what you can automatically you know, predict from a neurological level, you have increased anxiety and increased depression. So you have lower energy, you won't feel yourself and you won't be able to act in the ways you want to. So instead of waiting till you're ill, let's get at the yellow and then start talking to people. One of the first places you can go for help though in everyone probably on this, you know, this, this webinar has a connection to a general practitioner, your medical doctor. They are a key connection to getting to someone else if it needs to be some, someone else. It's a key connection to getting someone like me as a psychologist, to Kelsey as a nutritionist, Mark as a physiotherapist. So you can use them as that key and to the hallway of the opportunities that you have. But this is a way to think about yourself as a performer where am I? And to check in with that, ask those questions of yourself. Hopefully that gives you some information to start with, but sleep is your number one performance enhancer. You want to start with that. And then from that, really kind of gauge how you're doing throughout a training cycle, throughout your life cycle. And what I'm going to hand it off to is that people are going to go deeper into some of the other pieces I talked about. Nutrition, Gut brain, the brain's connected to the gut, clearly important. I hand it off to my trusted colleague and expert. Before I start, um, I forgot to mention this before, but after each of us, we're going to invite V to come along and answer a couple of questions. She doesn't know what we're asking her, um, so it's more just to bring the athlete voice into this. So V, if you're hanging about, um, come on camera. Um, and John, I am on camera. Sorry, oh, if you can't see me. There you go. You've come up on our screen now. Um, so John's got a couple of questions he's going to ask you. Um, how are we, John? Don't worry. You're going to be fine. <laughs> Where do you place your smartphone when you sleep? Um, usually on my bedside table or on the ground, depending where I am, if I have a bedside table. Yeah, but it's always in um, do not disturb at like 9 p.m. <laughs> till yeah. 7 a.m. That's fantastic. One of the things I would say, though, is, is just kind of be specific. And I think you're doing it. It needs to be six feet away from your head, even on airplane mode. When notifications push through and you're looking at brainwave, which I'll see when I do sleep studies, 
your brain wakes up. So I can actually take your phone after looking at a sleep study and actually actually see every time a text or notification pushed through and you're suddenly being awoken. And so and it just needs to be away. Even I do not disturb. Yes. What's what's um six feet in centimeters? I think just oh like... yes. Oh <laughs> thank you so meters. much. Wow. You can tell by my horrible accent that I'm from the US and uh, although I'm Canadian by a metric system, you guys help me out. Six feet. Six feet, six foot, right? Yep. Yeah. 183 centimeters. There you go. 183 centimeters. Okay. Yeah. Your night nightstand is typically that far, but sometimes not, but the floor definitely is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The best case scenario is to actually not have the phone in the room at all and charge it in another in another room because you can always get an alarm clock. You can all go old school. Uh, but I know a lot of us use our phones, but the radio frequencies absolutely disrupt our sleep. Um, the other question I would have for you is, as an athlete, do you take naps? I have tried and I try sometimes if I'm really tired, but more often I will not take a nap I don't really have time, but if I do, I will just lie down and and not do anything. But I can't usually nap during the day. I'm not very good at it. It's a skill, I think, that I haven't developed. <laughs> it's actually, you framed it wonderfully. And, and, and actually, it is a skill in which in a modern life, we live in an attention economy that if we left our bones on here, they would kind of go off every 30 seconds and so it triggers us to be constantly on and so your point about that all of us kind of train ourselves out of taking naps but you do the the thing that's so wonderful is just laying down closing your eyes does have a restorative effect if that's boring for people putting headphones on with actually some very light enjoyable chill music actually calms the brain down and you get a restorative effect but as an elite athlete's you want to think about taking a nap. A nap is anything from 10 minutes to an hour and a half. Anything an hour and a half will disrupt sleep at night. And that's why we kind of stare at the ceiling. So you're doing a lot of things really, really well. It's just those pieces that uh, I would encourage to the people that are on there to consider. But you're doing some wonderful things because phones can really distract our sleep and naps are opportunities to get better. So thank you, V. Thank you. Um, cool, thanks, John. Uh, uh, there's just a question in the chat. Um, um, we're just getting back to monitor. Phone. Is the do not disturb the same as flight mode? They both relatively do the same thing, but uh, they do not turn off the radio frequencies. And so they do kind of, again, if you're close to it, it will jump up your brain waves. There's two things that keep us addicted to our phones a bit. It's the light frequency and it's radio frequency. So those are relatively the same. Yeah. Great question. Um, oh, thanks, Vic. Um, So I will now jump on and talk about how to feel yourself for supporting growth, development, and your performance. Obviously, all really important things as young sailors. Um, so we'll go through what happens when your energy needs are not met, energy needs are not met, um, what causes underfueling, why nutrition is important in maintaining female health, um, eating to support your energy expended, and how to know that you're actually eating enough. So I guess in order to actually understand what happens when our energies aren't met, we kind of need to understand what energy availability actually is. So as you can see with that wee equation up the top, um, energy availability is the energy left over after the cost of exercise has been removed from what you've basically taken on board in a really simplistic way. Um, the rest of it left over is sort of what's used for growth, development, um, learning, school, um, social activities, work, and all 11 systems that John talked about, keeping them running um, in the background. Obviously, those are things that we don't see, but it's all happening beneath the surface. Um, it's like things like breathing and your heart beating, so they're kind of essential. Um, you can easily see how if you're in a low energy of available state for quite a long time, that can lead to things such as increasing your risk of energy, as it can impair your um, bone, ligament, and tendon development. Um, it can increase your risk of illness, um, lead to some poor mental health, as John's talked about there, lead to poor recovery, low energy, poor concentration, none of which sounds like a good time, if you ask me. 
Um, and then if we think about what can actually cause underfueling, it can be lack of awareness. So that's what we're trying to overcome today by just increasing your awareness to actually what this could look like. Um, it could be that you haven't actually got enough time or you haven't prioritized time to actually plan and prepare enough food for the week because we know as athletes, you're really busy people and often food is kind of like the last least fun thing to think about for a lot of people. Um, so we just need to bump it up on the priority list and that goes along the lines with time restraints. And then there's things like purposeful restriction. This could be something like um, if you've been told you need to drop some weight, which I'm hoping you I hope you haven't, but I know the realities of sports that some of you may have um, for whatever class you're in. Um, so that could mean that you just choose to skip a meal. It could be that you choose to skip a food group. Whatever it is, that is a really key thing that can lead to underfueling. Um, same thing with skipping meals, whether that's intentional or unintentional. It could be as simple as not waking up in time to have breakfast or a pre-workout um, snack. Um, it all builds up over the day. And as teenagers your energy demands are so high um or this burning need to burn off food mentality or I can't eat because I haven't exercised or I haven't exercised so I don't deserve to eat kind of mentality which is running rampant through um social media and diets and all of that so I think all really easy causes of underfueling whether they're intentional or not um so just something to be aware of here um so now you know what happens when your energy needs aren't met. Um, let's flip it around and talk about how we can best support your health and performance and development through food. Um, so before I dive into that, I do just want to cover off some really basic nutrition bits just so we're all on the same page. Um, so we've got our beautiful food group up the very top. So we've got carbohydrates. These guys are our friend, no matter what you hear on social media or in diets. This is what makes your brain tick. This is what you use while you're exercising and ultimately you need them for learning, you need them for everything. Um, so if you are terrified of that top row, um, you don't have too many reasons to be, um, they are your friend. Um, if we think about what carbohydrates are actually found in, those are things like our bread rolls, um, oats, grains, pasta, um, basically anything beige in color, potatoes, kumara. Um, so yeah. Don't be scared of them. They're great. They give us energy and that's what you need. Um, we've then got our protein foods. So our protein foods are things like your um, meat, poultry, fish, eggs, milk, lentils, legumes, tofu, um, dairy products, etc. cetera. Um, protein is quite a buzzword in the sporting community. Um, it's super important for our recovery and repair of our muscles. Um, so it actually means that the training that you're doing, you can actually adapt and get better. Um, essentially and especially with growing individuals that's really important um, if you have a meal without any sort of protein containing foods it can kind of mean that you may just feel hungry really quickly so if you just have toast with mama for breakfast in the morning chances are you might feel hungry in about 30 or 40 minutes after eating it if you chuck some eggs in there you might get an hour and an hour and a half of fullness and satisfaction out of that meal and typically teenagers from my experience under eat on the protein front um, so it's usually a pretty easy one for um, teenagers in that space. Um, we've got fruit and veg. I'm pretty sure I don't need to introduce this group, but just some bad news for you teenagers that don't like uh, fruit and veg is five plus a day is gone. It's now seven plus a day. Um, so the expectation is five veggies or five servings of veg and two servings of fruit a day. Um, you can never get enough of them. They're full of vitamins and minerals and just really important for maintaining our overall health and well-being. Um, and then we've got our healthy fats, so uh, things like your salmon, your um, oil, so olive oil is a classic, nuts, seeds, nut butters, um, anything kind of oily that seems healthy um, is really important for your vitamins A, D, E and K, which again, really important for maintaining health um, and well-being, especially brain health because we get our omegas from them. Okay, now that's done, we'll move on to the fun, more fun stuff. Um, so. Basically, in order for you to support your energy needs, um, I try to keep it really simple. Basically, if you're not eating three meals a day now, that's your first place to start. Um, it's really important as athletes to fuel regularly throughout the day. Um, the body loves routine um, with sleep. It loves routine with everything, and food is one of those things. Um, 
for main meals, I like to sort of talk to the rule of threes. I don't generally like rules, uh, but it's more of a guideline. Um, but if you can get three food groups, uh, so whether that's protein, carbs, and some veggies, um, or fruit, depending on if it's a breakfast and a sweet, um, three colors um, and three, uh, three food groups, three colors and three textures into a meal. It ultimately makes it a lot more satisfying for you to eat and a lot more um, filling and you're going to be getting a lot more vitamins and minerals and nutrients in to support the health as well as the performance side of things. Um, the best way I can use to describe why this is important is if we think of pumpkin soup, it's one food group, it's one color and it's one texture. And I don't know many people that can eat pumpkin soup and then be like, damn, I'm so satisfied. That was so filling. Um, I don't feel like I need to eat anything else. Um, typically, you're kind of looking for something else after having pumpkin soup. I do love pumpkin soup. I'm not hating on it, but <laughs> that's just a really easy example as to why it's important to get those things in. Um, other areas which are really important to work on to make sure you're meeting your energy demands is uh, pre and post training snacks. Um, making these snacks substantial. So if you're just having a muesli bar, have a muesli bar and a banana um, before a training. So you want these to be high carb, um, mainly because that's, again, the fuel that you're using in that training session. Um, and then when you come in off the water or you come in or you finish in the gym, that's kind of when you want to bring in the protein-containing snacks. So if that's some yogurt, if that's a smoothie, if that's, I don't know, something else, a ham and cheese sandwich, um, trying to get some kind of carbs and protein in after you come in from a training. Um, and I'd normally say within about 30 minutes, because if we count back from the two or three hours you spent on the water, it's probably been three to four hours since you last ate a proper piece of food. Um, and the body is actually really needing some nutrients and some um, fuel and some recovery uh, at that point. So the rule of twos is kind of what I recommend for any pre and post snack. Um, pre, you can sort of focus more on like fruit and carbs. Post, I'd be more focusing on sort of like protein and something else, which contains carbs preferably. Um, I'd highly recommend sitting down. I know this is not a fun activity, but sit down on a Sunday night or a Saturday whenever your parents go and do the groceries or if you do the groceries and actually figure out four or five snacks that you want to have during the week. Write down what you need for those and actually either go with your parents go by them yourself whoever does the shopping um go and make sure you've got them available because if you've got them available you're more likely to actually be able to grab and go as opposed to having to forage through the pantry or the fridge grabbing whatever it is that you think you might need um so if it's available you're more likely to actually fuel yourself properly um just on this here's an example of what a day in a of a sailor could look like. Now this has been put together for um, someone like V where they gym in the morning and then have afternoon um, sessions in, on the water. So a pre-gym snack could be something like an up and go banana and a muesli bar if you're really short on time or it could be a bowl of uh, wheat picks with some milk, um, whatever you can eat. Some people really struggle to eat in the morning before the gym. So that's kind of just a, here's a light option, but there are other options that you could try. Um, so as I said there before, general rule of thumb, pre-training, high carb. Um, a breakfast, this is quite a big breakfast. Um, if you can't eat that much, that's totally okay. Um, but it's just trying to get across the point of carbs, protein. Um, you can even have veggies in there. I didn't even add them in, but you could add some avocado or you could add in some spinach with breakfast to get your colors in there. And um, we've got morning tea. Now, this is normally where you could make a lot of impact, um, especially being at school. I know when I was at school, I'd just have a wrap and a piece of fruit, and that'd be my lunch, and I'd be done for the day, not knowing why I was crashing so hard at 3.30 at training. Um, so your morning tea is probably the equivalent of what you may be having for lunch now, at a guess. I'm making assumptions here. And then your lunch um, could be something a bit more substantial, so something that you'd probably have for dinner, that kind of level of... Um, nutrition and density of food um, so if you have leftovers from dinner great if not then the classic tuna rice and a salad would actually be quite a good one or um, if you make a pasta the night before which might have all like your protein and your veggies in it as well um, if you are training for more than I'd say an hour and an hour to an hour and a half have some snacks and training um, I typically wouldn't recommend gels to anyone under 18 but if you've got them I know some of you do um you can use them but things like dried mango or dried fruit is a really easy high carb option to have on the water some osms or your ems power, co power cookie bars 
Um, and if it's a really hot day, get some electrolytes in while you're out there um, or when you come back in, um, just to make sure that you're rehydrating because it does get pretty hot, hot out on the water, especially now we're coming into summer. Um, and hydration is a really key part of maintaining your performance. Um, post-training, chocolate milk is like the most amazing post-training uh, snack. It's got carbs, it's got electrolytes, and it's got um, protein um, or a smoothie. Um, yeah, either way, both of them offer great nutrition. Um, and then obviously dinner, having your uh, veg, your carbs, and your protein. And then something which is a really important part to actually getting energy in is we do most of our growth development and recovery when we're sleeping. Um, so actually making sure there's enough available protein floating around in your body um, and energy to support recovery while you're sleeping. Um, so whether that's some yoga and fruit, that's probably the easiest go-to snack before bed um, just to make sure you're topped up with that, especially if you do wake up really hungry, that's probably a good sign that a pre-bed snack could be beneficial for you. I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> How to know you're eating enough. Um, so basically, if you've got good energy throughout the day, you're sleeping well, you're waking up feeling energized. Um, I do res I do understand that there may be some days where you don't wake up feeling energized. It's probably right, somewhat normal. Um, for people that are growing and um, athletes as well. Um, you've got stable hunger and fullness cues throughout the day. So you feel that you're not having this massive sudden hunger randomly throughout the day, or you actually, you get your hunger and fullness cues. I think it's a really good sign because if you don't, that's a sign that you're not doing great. Um, you can maintain concentration throughout the day. I know that can be hard even when you're well fueled sometimes, but you know, take what you can get. Um, you're not going to bed hungry. You feel like you've got enough energy to get through your sessions without feeling like you're hitting the wall or you're bonking. That seems to be the word that I hear a lot in the sailors. Um, and you've got a regular menstrual cycle once you get it. Um, so if you notice that your menstrual cycle changes, um, suddenly it might get longer or it might be shorter um, or suddenly just the nature of it changes. And um, these are all signs that maybe you're not feeling well enough uh, so just something to be aware of in that space there um before i get everyone to ask questions i do have my question for v um so my question for you v was has there been a time where you've not nailed your nutrition and if so what happened there has definitely been several times where i've not nailed my nutrition um and i think especially uh as I was probably your ages um because I didn't really know but I found but even now um as well but I find that I I am good for a day um but then the following day I get if I haven't eaten enough I get super hungry like overly hungry and then I just my schedule I guess of eating goes all out of whack um because then I eat way too much before training or something and feel way too full or eat way too much for dinner and go on like go to bed really uncomfortable um and if I don't now know my nutrition over a longer period of time so like a racing week um I tend to just what Kelsey said you know crash by the end of the week I have just no energy I don't you know my brain fog and all that kind of stuff that just isn't good for performance or learning or or the tasks at all but not a great time <laughs> no um and the other question is what's your favorite go-to on the water snack knew that question was coming <laughs> um my I've got three and they're all bars uh the first is LCMs which is Kelsey's um recommendation for to me that one uh then I've got um there's these the brand tasty and they do these oat um squares so I think they're reasonably new but they come in little squares and like turquoise packets um those and then the mother nature they're like those bars um those kitty bars that have like the the kind of jam inside them or something and they're round and they're pretty small but they're just real easy to to get down and and chew and I think it has changed over the years, but you need to find something that 
you're going to want to eat and that's not going to make you feel sick or make your mouth dry and things like that. Because I used to have snacks on the water that were really good, but I was like, I don't want to eat that. So then I wouldn't eat it. Yeah, great point there. There is really about finding something that works for you. Um, yeah. So thank you for sharing that. And does anyone have any questions in there? As long as my chat's working, no, <laughs> no, but I might be. Well, I mean, oh. anyone does have questions, chuck them in the chat and I can answer them after Mark's presented. Um, but hopefully that was helpful. Um, yeah, we'll move on to Mark about injury prevention. Right. Hi, everybody. So, yes, I'm, uh, I'm a physio here at Hyperfit Sport working with the sailors, um, and I ex sailor myself. so kind of know the game but um yes I'm sorry I'm last I was just talking about the brain and the food interesting things and I'm starting to fade a little bit myself so <laughs> bear with me so injury prevention and sailing so first of all injury prevention um and an injury prediction I guess it's kind of the holy grail in uh, sports medicine um it's not really uh necessarily a possible thing to predict injuries um preventing injuries though there is some evidence that we can do something. So just uh, go to this slide here. So it's a bit of a busy slide, sorry, but um, this is um, a pretty recent journal paper about injury, injury prediction and injury, um, yeah, injury prediction. So it's basically showing there's no one factor that can um, cause injury. Okay. So it's, it's got two ACL examples here. So on the A on the A side, there's a basketball player, um, and basketball has a high risk of injuries for this particular injury. ACL is a large, um, well, a, a significant injury to the knee, uh, and the other side is a ballet dancer, also another sport that has a decent risk profile for ACL injury. Now, sailing might not be quite the same uh, risk profile, but it can happen. And also, there's also this, as the sport's getting faster and faster, um, you know, there's potentially more chance of these type of things happening, potentially. But you sort of see down the bottom left of the of the side on the of the A column basketball. Up. So previous injury. So she had a previous injury. That's uh, that's something that's quite com common. And if you have if you have a previous injury, that does increase your chance of having an injury in the same in another area. So we'll talk about that later on. Um, but that this particular athlete had a had an un un unanticipated environmental event, slipped on the floor. They already had some a, a bad patterning with dynamic knee valgus. It just means your knee moves in when you move, um, and they had some weakness in the hip. So those the slip and the weakness and the movement patterning. Played a played a role, but it wasn't an all related, but it wasn't the whole picture. The ballet dancer, big one there, is fatigue. And so obviously John and Kelsey just talked about that. So that's quite a big one. Um, level of attention anxiety. Not sure whether they were overly anxious or what the what the deal was with that one, but it just shows again lots of different uh, different scenarios can um, can potentially cause these. So so going through those, yeah, it's a previous injury, high uh, high chance of having another injury in the same area. So we've got to make sure you get a little bit of a niggle somewhere. You've got to start um, getting that right, basically. Age, as you're growing, um, higher risk of obviously growth injuries. Um, but yeah, lots of younger and and older group are potentially a little bit more vulnerable to changes in load while they while they um learning the neuromuscular. Um, the, the neuromuscular control. Let's we'll talk about it again. Um, sex, some injuries, not all. Um, females more more commonly can uh, can get injured. This particular one, ACL, very much so. Six times the rate of males. But we can't do much about those three. But we can do a little bit about this training load and volume. That's another thing there. And we can do a bit about neuromuscular control and strength. So. Training load and volume, as well as for, as well as nutrition, as well as sleep, um, kind of all play a part of that training load and volume, and making sure that you are know, relatively fresh and um, and switched on. And it's interesting uh, hearing uh, John's slide on the um, the reaction time, uh, reaction time for uh, fading quite quickly if you uh, don't have the sleep. And so 
neuromuscular control and strength. That's all those other little things. And we can work on those. So we can work on those bottom two, um, bottom two things. Here's a video that may or may not play. Sure it's going to play. We go here. So I don't know how many of you guys have seen this. This was a few years back. Just a wee bit of a crash here. And so now can you can you prevent that? Is that just a lottery? Um, can we can we change that or not? And I've got there's, there's a bit of a yes and a no. So we we can we can potentially help to mitigate the risk of injury with that scenario. If if the reaction times are really good, that's going to potentially help. If the person's got enough mobility to see where they're going to land, that's also going to potentially help. If they've got quite good trained patterns of movement as well, that they can land in some in a, in a, either a nice roll forwards or if they're going to land and hit something, they're going to not going to just land with a stiff leg. That's again potentially going to potentially going to help them. Um, but this all takes time. It takes a lot of time and consistency. So you just can't kind of rush these things, but just gradually building on, gradually building on what you have, trying to work on those uh, little details in time. And so trying to nail training principles, that's kind of strength, loading principles, that's that's uh, how much you do and mix quite in with the recovery and the, everything else as well, um, and nailing how to move well. I feel like key uh, key controllables that we can that we can play a part in mitigating the risk. This is a this is a uh, stolen stolen thing. It said time on court. Ah, I did cross that out and made it, it time on water. <laughs> um, but this was stolen from netball. Um, there's a lot of netball uh, injury prevention work done. Uh, big high risk, probably, probably a higher risk sort of sport for injuries than uh, than sailing in general. But it still makes sense to me. So even below that in the pyramid, you could have good sleep, good recovery, good nutrition, um, improving improving your fundamental movement skills. We'll talk about that. Sports specific skill strength on top of that, and then you sort of become physically capable movers, and that can enhance your performance both for sailing and and minimize the injury risk. So I know I'm talking about injuries, which is nah, but a bit hard to listen to injuries the whole time, but if we can kind of think about by reducing your injury risk, you're actually improving your performance, the time on water um, will, will also improve. So yeah, doing, doing the basics consistently. So training principles, there's a whole bunch of different training principles. Essentially, I've just highlighted a couple here. Uh, individuality, you got to know what you're training for and what movements you need to do on the boat. Progressive progression, slowly increasing your training load to, to slowly, gradually get stronger. Keep on all the different uh, recovery st strategies as well. So, um, yeah, that's basically that. So, also, there's a, uh, there's a little bit of an old one now, 2014, but a article that showed whether strength training or stretching or proprioception, which is balance and neuromuscular type of uh, drills, watching your alignment, et cetera, protects more against sport injuries. And it actually really showed that strength and proprioception did more. So the stretching didn't really have much of a benefit. Now there's still is benefit in stretching, but it doesn't necessarily improve injuries. It might help improve your general mobility, but that's a, possibly a lower, a lower factor. So make sure you're strong enough. Kind of can't go wrong getting strong as long as you're moving well. The loading principles. So again, doing the basics consistently. So this picture on the bottom right is again a little bit old and a little bit it's been debunked. So basically a bit of a theory though on uh, on how to load. So if you had, for example, if you sort of sailed twice a week and you played social twice a week so you have 10 hours of sport a week that's kind of what we kind of consider your weekly load is 10 hours so you did 10 hours every week if you do 10 hours every week they call that your, your sort of chronic load or your fitness you're kind of used to that 10 hours but then say all of a sudden you win the youth event or win the nationals and you decide you're going to then to double your sailing days uh, and you're going to also try and run a couple of times to get fit and all of a sudden you just double that load up to 20 hours of sport so that would be a doubling of the ratio. So that would be 
of uh, coming over to this, this red zone, the 2.0 on the bottom right. So you can see there's a bit of an increased risk of injury in that zone. Now, that's not always a bad thing. Um, it won't always cause an injury, but just does, uh, you've got to consider, I think, listening to your body with that as well. So, you know, sometimes you can double double the load for a week uh, if it just, if it ties in with everything else. If, you, if you're probably not doing exams at the same time, you can get really good sleep. You can have, you've got your nutrition plan done. Um, but just, just as something to consider. The other side of that as well is the underloading. So if you don't do, if you do your 10 hours uh, a week as your usual, and then you sort of gradually think, oh, that's enough. So start going, oh, just a couple of hours of, of sailing a bus, sailing a netball. And you start, that starts becoming your new chronic load when your new fitness is a couple of hours. And then all of a sudden you've got a regatta and that's another 20 hours. So that's going to be, now, 10 times on the ratio rather than just uh yeah just sort of staying in that in that more blue zone that sort of sweet spot so yeah something to consider and ponder um how that fits in with things and so yeah just caveat listen to your body consider your life and other things that are um around that whether whether you do want to jump a little bit into the red zone or not um don't want to ski by not doing anything you gotta do you gotta do something so again, the neuromuscular part of it. So doing the basics consistently, learning to move well. Um, I'm assuming you're all in different levels of um, different ages and uh, ages and stages. But um, and we have access for the high performance sport athletes to the gym, and they do a lot of regular work in there. But I think where you can trying to consider good movement patterns will be um, will put you in 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 good favour. And there's a few there's a few different uh, there's a few different sort of movement patterns out there really that are fundamentals. And I think a squat, a lunge was the bottom bottom part of this really, a squat, lunge, a push, a pull movement, and then a single leg balance, single leg squat is really is really key. There's some also some more rotation stability and some range of motion on the on the higher, higher part there. These are just different screens that have been used in the past. Um, as time's gone on, they've been found to be not solely related to injury, so they kind of get pushed a little bit by the wayside. But I think it's part of that whole web of determinants. It's, if that is really good, it might just help a little bit, but as long as the other things are pretty good as well, might just might just reduce the risk of injury. But if it's just this one thing and there and there's a uh, and people aren't sleeping and aren't repeating well, there's um, you never know. They might. Yeah, it might not play such a big role. So for sailing, I just got a, got a picture of uh, got a couple of pictures here, not not too many here, but of Pete and Blair. Um, and so existent sailors. And so, like, how do these relate to that? And and it is a bit of a unique sport sailing. There's sort of so many different classes, obviously, as well. But you can sort of see here that that Blair there's doing a fair bit of rotation. So he's doing, got some good trunk rotation. It's quite quite needed in sailing. Having good rotation and being able to separate that from the hips and pelvis is, uh, is important. So, uh, yeah. And then here we go. Got Pete doing some squatting type of motion. Obviously a bit of balance as well. I guess if, if I was to look at, a, if, if I a potentially a more novice uh, 49er sailor, it might be kind of more crunched up there, might be more flexed and not really, uh, yeah, potentially over overloading the lower back, or or us really stiff legged and not not sort of being as balanced and using that whole chain. So you can get some of it by training and considering it when you're going training. You can do some of it when you, if you're doing some gym or you're doing some warm up exercises, or you're doing another sport. So if you you want to go into your F45, thinking about good patterning for that, or your CrossFit, or if you're going to do some netball training or some other training, making sure you're uh, concentrating on that warm-up aspect. Uh, again, the, a bit of uh, that bend over, bend over pull motion. So there's, there's a lot of really combined here. Um, or hiking athletes. So a lot about quads and quads and core, really. Um, but there's a lot of rotation, rotation stability. There's a lot of, yeah, pulling motions again. And... Uh, and so same same thing here. Another another laser sailor, good hiking position, rotation stability, pulling motion, and 
yeah, rotation plus leg strength with the um, for lunge. So, so they might not. Uh, so they're just sort of fundamental movements. It's hard to sort of sometimes see the link, but they will they will link. I think you can get caught up with lots of fancy exercises, but I think doing the fundamentals well will start making you move well consistently. Um, I think that next week it's going to be talked about a little bit more, but as you're going through different stages of the menstrual cycle as well, there's a difference in your neuromuscular control. So if you at one point you're feeling I, I can I can just I can do a single leg squat, I can do a lunge with a rotation and it's and it's fine, but then that sort of falls by the wayside or you or you go to a different part of your menstrual cycle, that can be a little bit less coordinated in certain certain times. So it's quite hard to judge that, but I think one way to mitigate against that is just doing those same things quite consistently. And that's me. Thank you very much. Um, and question for V. Uh, so I suppose on the back of the other other chats as well, um, is there anything in your regatta recovery in terms of sleep, nutrition, or or the physical aspects that you do differently now than you would have done three or four years ago? Yes, a lot. Um, <clears throat> I think the most recent one that's helped me the most is that after a day of sailing, I, um, especially in a regatta, will always um, try and bike for at least 15 minutes, just really easy. And I find that that just helps me sleep and relax um, a lot better. And then just to get my heart rate down, because you're sort of like pumped from racing, um, that gets my heart rate down and it allows me to just wake up in the morning as well because I've had a better sleep because I'm more relaxed, kind of add to that recovery. Just the one question. Just the one question. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, doesn't look like there's any other questions in the chat box. So we'll hand it back over to you, Jenny, to wrap it up. Well, it's just unmuting. Um, cool. Um, awesome. So I have certainly, um, I've certainly enjoyed this, and I'm really, and I've actually learned some things. Um, sleep comes first, probably my top one of my top things. I'm gonna try and put my phone a bit further away from my bed. Um, more chocolate milk, Kelsey. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I guess probably the biggest takeaway for me is is really listen to your body and just notice some things happening and and if it's not happening how you think it should then try and see see a reason or seek some help if if something's not going quite right. Um, so I really really happy to see everybody online. I think this has gone really well. I'm really pleased. Um, thank you to the high performance team for helping me put this together. And thank you, V. Really appreciate your help here, and your uh, your knowledge, and to show us how much you're learning from all this inf new information. And hopefully, we'll see you next week again too. Um, so next week, a little teaser for next week. We've got a couple different topics. So um, balancing energy costs and having a healthy menstrual cycle is one of our topics, and then. Um, we're going to look at the journey of a high performance athlete. So what it looks like from being a junior athlete through to a top, um, top world class um, sailor and how that journey looks. Um, so if you think of any questions um, between now and next week, bring them along to the presentation next week, drop them in the chat and there'll be a, definitely a, a time for questions. We will have these presenters here available for questions too. Um, we have recorded the session, so we'll we'll make that available to everybody and also people who were not here tonight as well. Um, I hope you all learned something. And as always, I am. Um, if you have any questions, anything, drop me an email, drop me a line. Um, and if I can't help you, I definitely know a lot of people who know a lot more than me.
can point you in the right direction. So um, I guess uh, that's a wrap from us.